Hello and welcome to Your Health in Your Hands. I'm Dr. David Ajibade, and I hope you are having a great week so far. Now, as you know, our focus, our goal, our mission, really, our mandates is to, is to educate Blacks, Nigerians in particular, but Blacks all over the world with regards to their health, their brain health, their cardiovascular health, and their gut health, and so on, and to point out the, our uniqueness, our biological differences between us and probably other races. And as you know, I've been doing a lot of work with regards to dementia and dementia in the African community. And by the way, <laughs> uh, in Baltimore, where I currently am, we recently we were I was selected by the grace of God to be one of the Baltimore's game changers, like who's who in Baltimore, because of the work that we've been doing to enlighten and educate Blacks especially where dementia is concerned. Now in this country, blacks are twice as likely as whites to have dementia. And a lot of it, unfortunately, this isn't being talked about like it should be. A lot of, a lot of it is due to the cardiovascular risk factors. In other words, things like hypertension, diabetes, uh, kidney disease, and other things that affect the way blood flows through our brains. And I feel this is a big mistake because as we are as the rest of the world, Nigeria is included, is aging, and as we're growing older and older and older, these conditions will begin to be more and more frequent. And we have to understand that the health of our cardiovascular system is paramount. Whether we're talking about cancer, whether we're talking about kidney disease, whether we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia, the health of our cardiovascular system is paramount. And that is why I'm so excited today to have our special guest on today, who is a, an expert in this field. And without much further ado, I'm going to uh, welcome Dr. Iziegu and ask him to introduce himself. Thank you, sir, and welcome. Let's, let's know more about you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jugade, and thanks for all you do uh, for our community and raising awareness in the area of brain issue and actually more on prevention. Uh, that's really very important. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, congratulations on your award and selection as well. Um, yes, I'm Dr. Kamelu Sezugu. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I've been practicing cardiology now for over 20 years. Um, and I'm from Nigeria, actually, originally. And uh, the thing is that when I left Nigeria, I left there with the intent of coming back to Nigeria because of health-related issue. When I left Nigeria, the ratio of doctor to uh, patients was about one doctor to 30,000 people. So my goal was to come to America, study medicine, and come back home to help. And when I got here after my training as an interventional cardiologist and as a critical care specialist, it was difficult to practice what I have learned back home in Nigeria. And um, I have moved to prevention and now moving into the era of trying to help Nigerians and Africans and everybody in different underserved areas in the area of managing hypertension very well, as this is a major risk factor that kills not people, but also destroys their organs and impacts the brain, as Dr. Jibade was mentioning. But anyway, that's why we're here today to discuss some of those, especially this month. As you know, this is uh, <laughs> Black History Month, and uh, it's also uh, American uh, uh, Heart Disease Month, and the Valentine's Month as well, which is wow. everything dealing with the heart. And uh, But as we celebrate the achievement of our um, elders here in America and other places in the world, uh, we still have work to do in the area of preventive uh, 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 care, especially in cardiovascular issues, especially hypertension and what it does on our people. Thank you again. Yes, indeed, sir. A great start to it. I know you've sent us some slides. So as we're speaking, uh, the slides will be displayed. Thank you, Yinka and the team that makes this whole thing work. So why, why don't we start by saying, Doc, uh, or by answering this question, why... What is it about we Africans that that cardiovascular disease is so prominent amongst us? I mean, what what did we do? What did we do that we do that we're in this situation? Eh? Yeah, I like the question about what did we do. Now, um, it's not really an issue of what did we do. <laughs> it's just that um, 
uh, hypertension actually is one of the major drivers of cardiovascular problem in the African-American patients and Africans, okay? And the thing is that the risk we have is more to do genetically. Um, and also because of our genetics, we are more sensitive to salt. Mm. And as you know, many of the food products today are really laden with salt for preservation. Yes. And so as we consume them, you know, again, the blood pressure runs very high. Mm -hmm. and on, on top of that, there's a lot of environmental issues. You know, some of us, where we live, the safety of the environment, you know, less in America here, people worry about guns. Mm -hmm. You know, even the death of family members because of other things they, they cannot control social factors, you know, let's say racism even, mm -hmm. and even issue with transportation, mm -hmm. and issue with maybe economic factors as to finding money to buy any type of food or choosing between their food and their medication with the money they have, and they also yeah. want to support family members, you know, and other stresses that they, you know, people go through every day. I mean, look at Nigeria and also look at the amount of stress people go through every day. Yeah. You know, people may even work, they don't know if they're going to be paid and they have family to support. You mm -hmm. know, so there are many, many things that expose people to, you know, uh, stresses that will drive the blood pressure high. But Doc, if I may, I'll jump in here. Sure. There are people in Nigeria who live in villages who maybe are not exposed to all these fried foods and these processed foods and who may not be exposed to the stressors that are common amongst city dwellers and people who live maybe in the U.S. downtown, so to speak. Uh, but even they, even they in those villages experience these things a lot. How do we, how do we explain that? And don't eat, I, I don't think they take that much salt. So how do we explain that? So that's a very excellent observation, actually. Uh, we still have high blood pressure in the rural areas, like in place in Nigeria, but mm. it's less than it is in the city but they still have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned again, uh, genetics plays a role here. Uh, as you know, you know, in those rural areas too, people still use salt you know, as much as possible. And some of them gravitate into what they call Western food, you know, and uh, look at something like Indomie that people mm -hmm. just buy anywhere. These are mm -hmm. with salt. Sometimes they buy some of the, uh, you know, uh, what they put in the soup to make up the soup that have a lot of sodium in them. You know, so many a time, these are the things that drive them, okay? And one of the things we also have to know with hypertension among us really is that hypertension tend to occur much earlier in age for the African-American patients than the other races. You know, and also it usually is very severe. So you can have an African American person walking around with blood pressure systolic in the 200s and feel like nothing is happening. Okay. And then, of course, because of that kind of situation, they also tend to run more complications, which are much more severe. And of course, you know, this will lead to risk of early death from the complications of hypertension. You know, you mm -hmm. see in Nigeria, people just drop off and drop, you know, and die like that. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you find where they begin to blame their neighbor, somebody poisoned them, or, they, you know, it has nothing to do with that. It's just that you have high blood pressure unmanaged and the stroke happens or an aneurysm ruptures and the person dies suddenly. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's serious. So, how oh. What is the way forward? Uh, I know we were talking off camera about things that the lay person, the man on the street, the woman on the street has to know, but also things that the doctors should know uh, about the uniqueness of the black situation and, and what we need to look out for. So that's a very good uh, uh, question. Um, the way forward is really what we call early detection. And uh, early detection involves, which means checking their blood pressures. And we encourage the doctors and patients to do that. Now, one of the ways that we do manage blood pressure 
is to use what we we'll call remote patient monitoring. Okay. Uh, remote patient monitoring is actually a technological tool that allows a patient to check their blood pressure and transmit that reading to the doctor. The doctor okay. will get those reading and from there begin to manage and adjust the medication for that patient even though the patient is way at home. This has been shown to not only make the patient be more engaged in their care, but also it's easier to manage that blood pressure and have it under control and also pick up high readings that can be intervened on before the patient runs into any catastrophic event such as a stroke or even an aneurysm rupture, you know. And so with that type of technology, it's much easier to manage patients. And on top of that, the type of technology allows us, like those of us who are here, to work with other providers in underserved areas to help detect blood pressure early and help them manage them appropriately. You know, and in so doing, you are able to avoid any of the complications that can happen with uncontrolled blood pressure, including heart failure, kidney failure, of course, stroke, even blindness, you know, and when all of these complications set in people, then, you know, the mortality rate just goes up on them. You right. know? And um, for a Nigeria, for instance, have access to what, what that remote patient monitoring, uh, heart disease prevention and training center in Nigeria have remote patient monitoring available to patients. And of course, he has a center you know, at Tonsoka in Enugu State and also in Lagos State. And on top of that, they have uh, kiosks you know, where people can go check blood pressures in pharmacies, um, in offices, in schools. They have those kiosks where people can be, you know, so you can pick up this blood pressure issue much earlier. And then it can be transmitted to the doctor and they can be referred for appropriate management of those. Yeah. So I was about to ask, because when you we were saying all this, I was thinking, oh, this seems like high tech and may not be available to people in Nigeria. Are you saying, Doc, that this is currently being practiced? Uh, you mentioned an organization. Is that your organization? Can you tell us more? Yes. So Heart Disease Prevention and Training Center, as I mentioned, as I stated in the beginning, uh, after my training here, it was hard to bring what I've learned here back home while I left home saying I'm going to come back to help. But so we had to open up Heart Disease Prevention and Training Center, a nonprofit uh, uh, center to help manage heart disease issues. Yes, the technology for remote monitoring is available in Nigeria and we're able to see those patients reading from here and work with the doctors in different places to manage them. We have you know, full understanding of the technological challenges in Nigeria, such as, you know, smartphone issue, data issue, phone. So we have a setup system that transcends those. We are, if you have smartphone, we can use Bluetooth system if you understand that on you. We can also use where you can key in the reading on a telephone. You know, we can also pay you up with family members who can check your pressure and transmit it. We also have our own nurses reaching out to patients in what we call, uh, you know, uh, community advocates and get their readings. So we have many ways that we can reach patients no matter where, where they are, you know, regardless of technology. And it's put in our system. We're able to see and manage those patients with their doctors. That is fantastic. Uh, do you have an, any idea of the numbers? By the way, you're not in Abuja yet, which to me, I find that a, as a big fault. Because that's where I'm based. I'm near Brain and Body Foundation is based in Abuja. What are you doing, Doc? What, what, what are you thinking? <laughs> yes, uh, that's a good. That's a good. A good one as well. As I mentioned, our system is very versatile. It's set up where we can reach anybody in any community where they are. We're even opening up a place in Ghana as well, and we're opening up many centers in Nigeria. You know, okay. so even if you're Abuja, you can enroll. And, and we can manage you from there. And we have patients who have come here in the States, we treat them, and then they go back and they roll in the center in Nigeria, and we are helping manage them through the doctors there from here because they have electronic health record, which we have them there. And then we have the 
remote monitoring uh, cloud system. So as they check in their reading and is going, we are seeing that we're also receiving the alerts on these individuals. So when we get the alert, we are reaching out to the doctor and I say, what's going on, you know? And we're also getting the doctors to be, you know, attentive to those alerts and their nurses who are managing them to be able to deal with those even before any issues will happen. So even though you are in Abuja, yes, we can manage you from there. And any place elsewhere in Nigeria, we can manage you from that location. As long as you have a phone and you can call, you, we can manage you. As long as our readings are transmitted, we can manage you. And if there's a pharmacy close to you that you want us to partner with as a hub in your area, you just let us know and we'll reach out to the pharmacy and set up a kiosk there for other people who may not have uh, the ability to have their own machine and stuff like that. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay, because you mentioned a couple of things that I feel... We may not have much time to go into in, in this session. Therefore, we're going to have to bring you back by force, by, by fire, by force next week <laughs> to talk more about this. But yeah. amongst the things, you, you've answered it a little bit. How do we get, how do, or how do Nigerians who are interested in enrolling for this program become enrolled? Do so they have to go through a doctor or a pharmacy? I mean, how do they, in practical terms? Right. So, um they can go to HDPTC, Heart Disease Prevention and Training Center, .org. So HDPTC.org. And okay. from there, they can pick up the phone number to call, and then they can be enrolled now. We are also requesting from the government from any level to really make blood pressure management easier for the patient through the National Health Insurance Scheme. You know, in that way, we can really help these patients prevent the complications of hypertension and reduce the overall cost of care. If you pick up this blood pressure issue and begin to manage them, not only do you prolong life, but you also, you know, reduce the chance of end organ damages. That actually is one of the major problems that, you know, happens with blood pressure. And maybe in our next section, we can talk more about those type of situation. Uh, yeah, yes. that, uh, that's, you know, they can enroll through there and we'll, we'll manage them from that. Yes. So question, you said it's a nonprofit. Do individuals have to pay, pay to enroll? Yeah. So because the, um, the cloud system cost mm -hmm. um, and because the doctors in Nigeria, you have to pay them. And the nurses and everybody, you know, that work in the clinic and stuff has to be paid. Yeah, there is a cost to, to, to care. But those costs are way, 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 way less compared to the usual cost for, you know, Nigerians pay for places. And if they call, they will give them those cost prices. You know, one of the things HDPTC tries to do is to really make diagnostic uh, access available to people. So like, for instance, like even for heart disease and in, in using what we call coronary CTA, picking up coronary disease early, when those tests are done, we can help from here, read them and make a determination if the patient needs to be transferred to any place for further care. You know, so the cost of going overseas or not going overseas, you can get the diagnostic test done and we can look in and see, you know, so you are getting the quality of care from here, even though you are in Nigeria. And then we can make a decision if the person can, you know, be, need to be moved somewhere or not, or whether it's something we can manage well there. But again, we are asking the government to really make this easier for people, because if you have national health insurance, then you wouldn't have any issue going to get care in some of this type of area, or even getting a blood pressure machine, or even going to check, you know, check your readings and stuff like that and transmitting that. Yes. Yes, I, I totally agree. And, and I, I, honestly, if, if I were minister for a day, I would absolutely put down the law that any pharmacy, any outlet, any health outlet, uh, whether it's pharmacy or even uh, government, government uh, offices and business offices, they should have a facility where the people can monitor and check, just go in for five minutes, check their hearts, check their, um, their, uh, their blood pressure regions and get out. I mean, this it should that should not be a problem. People should be able to maybe check anywhere they go, because since it's a big problem among blacks, among Nigerians especially, we should be able to have to be on to be on top of it. And I, it shouldn't yeah. be a challenge. You are absolutely right about that. Because if you look at the Nigerian population, for instance, 
70 million Nigerians have high blood pressure. Wow. And many of them don't even know that they have it and walk around with it because they don't have any symptoms. They don't even think about it. But then when the pressure comes down a little bit, they say it's, 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 it has come down. Now, out of that 70 million, only 10% really are controlled. Hmm. So you have many people walking around with uncontrolled hypertension with all the risks that can come with it, you know, and, you know, we are here to help to prevent those things. You know, even look at even when they play this soccer game with um, South Africa, we are, mm -hmm. we are having people dying from, from this type of situation. Yeah. You know, we can run advertisement on radios telling people, check your pressure, you know, don't, um, uh, don't get excited. But we can have real programs in place to really, you know, help curb this, uh, this issue. And we're here to help and do that. Yes. Amen to that. Now, the, the challenge is that what many people don't realize, we've had someone on the show, Professor, yes, Professor Anuma, she's an uh, endocrinologist based in Abuja. What she would do, because she's suspecting that this thing with hypertension wasn't just starting to be, wasn't just affecting people in their 40s and above, where we, th where we think usually that's when you start. She started finding out, and she would do this uh, spot check, so to speak, and go to these secondary schools and even primary schools. And she would find kids who are obese, who are, had hypertension, who had high blood sugar, who didn't have a clue they had in the Abuja area. And so she started raising the alarm. Um, unfortunately, it's to be regretted that uh, people didn't take her seriously enough. I don't know if she's still doing it, but we're having this thing at younger and younger ages. I don't know if it's a new phenomenon or this has been what has been the situation all this time. What do you say about the younger people getting hypertension and high blood sugar? Right. So um, what her observation is absolutely correct. It's not new. Um, high blood pressure tend to occur earlier for the African-American patient, the black patients. Again, genetic plays a role here where we have soil sensitivity. Many of our young ones are really into some of the, in, you know, Western diet type of thing. And so you are seeing more obesity. People are not working in the farm they used to do. You know, so you, you are, you're also finding them into a lot of social media stresses that you can, you know, you don't know about, but they walk around with this stress of friends and likes and no likes that actually drives high blood pressure. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of those issues. And we have kiosks in schools to check blood pressure. We have been pushing to have infirmary situation will take even a teacher or somebody and train them how to check blood pressures and then set up there so they can check blood pressure and transmit to the center you know, uh, for HDPTC. Because early detection is the key. When you pick it up early, then I educate the individual on how best to manage this situation and then appropriate therapy. And you can actually reduce the complications. And remember, this blood pressure issue runs in families. So if there's, a, if there's somebody, a dad or a mom that have high blood pressure, you might as well screen your children about that and, and start early because it runs in, you know, it's genetics. Yes, and parents should be more aware of the dangers of social media and not just let your kids use the phones willy-nilly willy for whatever, whatever it is. It's your responsibility as a parent to ensure that your kid uh, does not is not not sleeping with the phone twenty four seven. I mean, this is that that is in my opinion is very irresponsible, especially if you, especially for kids less than or below the age of twelve. Not just for the social stresses, but also for the impact on the brain. These br kids' brains are not fully formed yet, and their skulls are not fully formed yet. So the those powerful, in fact, they've been compared to microwaves. Those powerful waves that you put that this kid puts on on his head or her head or her ear they can go directly to the brain and, and wreak havoc. They may not experience it in, at first, but over a period of time, it can cause damage. And we don't want to wait until 10, 20 years before they now confirm that, yes, oh, phones are, have a problem. We want to start being aware of the threats now exactly. and be uh, avoid, especially amongst our kids, especially among the fact that you have money to buy a, a $1,000, 2000 smartphone does not mean you should buy it for your kid. Please take responsibility. Point. Yes. What do you think, Doc? I agree with you 100%. Um, we have been always an advocate about, you know, phone safety. 
um, if you take a cell phone and you are talking and you have network that is not very strong, it is trying to connect to network. And if you touch the head of that phone, it's very hot. Mm. So you can imagine you have it close to your you know, head. That heat is going through the skull. And mm -hmm. remember, the brain is fat cell. It's just fat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that heat. You know, so while it's hard for the powers that be to recognize that is an issue, it is a known fact. I mean, that people have issue with cell phone and brain and even brain tumors that uh, we have to be careful about. So it's important to really protect the brain from those things, yes. All right, Doc, I want to, our time is, is fast spent. I want to thank you for coming on today. We have other topics uh, we need to get into. We can't let you go yet. So we need to let we need to get into these topics, especially the topic of end organ damage. We want to be able to explain to people exactly how this um, prolonged, untreated things like hypertension can eventually eventually cause damage. So we can have a graphic, we can have graphic details to share with people so that they don't take this thing lightly, which is the problem too much of the time. So thank you again for joining us, sir. Any final words before we close? Yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, my final words is prevention, prevention, prevention. If you have not had your blood pressure check, please go check it. And when you check it, if it's high, and at least two occasions, you have high blood pressure. Don't deny just because you're not having symptoms. Get involved with a doctor to begin to manage it. We're going to talk about it maybe in your next session, how best doctors should manage these conditions. Because just because the number came down, it doesn't mean that your pressure is treated already. And that's exactly. very important to understand that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Well, Thank folks, you. thanks for joining us. And uh, we will see you next week. God bless. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.